Good evening, everyone. Um, happy Wednesday. My name is Takiwa T. Smith, founder and executive director of Science Engineering Mathematics Link, and I want to welcome you to our Teen Science Cafe. The Teen Science Cafe is a program of our Math and Science Career Academy, which exposes you to STEM and STEM careers. And the reason that we have the Teen Science Cafe is your teenage years is when you start to make decisions about what you're gonna do after you graduate from high school. So if you're in middle school, you think about what classes you wanna take, what um, out of school STEM activities you'll participate in, what summer programs. When you're in high school, you think about what you're gonna major in college, all of those things that are critical decisions that can chart your path. And being able to meet someone that is in the STEM fields, so you can either learn about a career path that you didn't know about before, or you kind of thought you wanted to do something and now you see somebody doing that, it can guide you and give you a little more insight on what this career path does and how you can follow that career path on your own. So tonight is super special for me because I have a fellow Rattler, but I also, <laughs> love roller coasters. Um, before we got live, I was telling our speaker, I need to get some more contacts. So I get back to my roller coaster riding because I'm slipping. Um, and so I didn't really know until I got to college that engineers actually design roller coasters. So you all are getting a heads up learning that a lot earlier than we did. Um, and the holidays are happening. So if you're somewhere where it's not too cold or you are fine with rolling a roller coaster with a jacket or you're going to a warmer climate, when you're out from school, it's a perfect time to get some roller coaster riding in um, and definitely during summer breaks. And so I'm going to introduce our speaker, um, Chris Hightower. Chris Hightower was born and raised in Orlando, Florida. He attended Florida AM University, where he graduated cum laude with a Bachelor of Science in Electronic Engineering and Technology in spring 2006. Since 2019, he has been a senior engineer for the Global Attraction Program for Universal Parks and Resorts. Respons his responsibilities include, include, but not limited to, upgrading attractions across all five of the Universal Parks, analyzing the projects from a technical safety and reliability perspective. He is a part of the African-American Network Diversity Inclusion Stair Committee at University of Orlando, where he drives to increase awareness of black culture and justice in the country and educating those willing to learn about them. He is also a member of the Universal Foundation Volunteer Board. Chris is also founding member and president of the Florida a University Engineering Technology Alumni Chapter, working with the School of Architecture, Engineering and Technology to increase opportunities and resources for students in the electronics and construction engineering technology programs. His personal passion is a nonprofit, the How Tire, How, oh, I'm struggling tonight. High Tower Foundation Incorporated that he and his wife, Janicia, started back in 2017. They focus on mentoring students in and from the Central Florida area at FAMU and other HBCUs. So I am going to turn it over to Chris and he's going to talk about his career in roller coasters. Right. <laughs> All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Nice to virtually meet all you out there. So go ahead and just get started here. So, I mean, Takiyo Tan already did the introduction, but I'll run back through it. So once again, my name is Chris Hightower. I was born and raised in Orlando, Florida. I am a second generation Orlandoan. Uh, you don't really get to meet too many people that's born and raised from Orlando, but my parents are from there. I'm from there. And now my daughter is from Orlando. So I attended Florida a &M University back in 2000. I graduated back in 2000. Six spring, I graduated Bachelor of Science in Electronics Engineering and Technology. Uh, currently, I work as a senior engineer for engineering and safety for our global attraction programs, and that's here at Universal Parks and Resorts. And I'll get a little bit into that more here as we continue forward. 
So I'll start with kind of my journey to STEM. So journey to STEM kind of started in middle school. And for me, it was a car audio magazine. Just that simple. I used to, I was infatuated with this magazine. I love looking at into the cars and seeing all the electronics in it. So seeing the big radios, seeing, I'm sorry, seeing the big speakers, seeing it had all these amazing sounds and just the lights and the, the hydraulics and everything that can go into it. And I really wanted to know how did all that work and how was it going into these cars? Uh, another thing that kind of got me into it is that in middle school, I had a technology class. And within this class, we just did various modules. So I can remember a module where I learned how to fly simulators uh, or flight simulators. So we got to fly different planes and just enjoy trying to learn, you know, trying not to crash them for the most part, but taking off, landing, just understanding how, how the inside of a plane work. Uh, I remember another one where we sat there and tried to figure out how just technology could cook a hot dog. So we used the sun and just some electronics on trying to cook a hot dog. Or one of the other ones was kind of creating your own film, sitting there, making it from steel frames, taking so many pictures at a time to get there. And then the other piece of it for me was just tinkering. So I was the kid that tore up my mom's electronics, plain and simple. I took apart a VCR, never got the chance to put it back together because I just didn't understand what I was doing, but I completely dismantled it and came back and you know just wanted to see what was all going on inside of it. Once I kind of got into high school, it became AC and DC circuits for me. So there was a class when I got to my junior year in high school, we had a partnership with our local a tech school and at that tech school they offered us ac dc circuits so that just got me going into electronics making me figure out hey how does this stuff really work like i know it has power i know these these components in here do something but that class really started to break it down for me and once again car audio so at this point now i'm starting to learn how to install these things you know install radios install big speakers and it, that was just the thing that me and some of my friends did we worked on all of our cars, they were, they were the car, our cars were our guinea pigs, and we basically would get speakers and radio and figure out how much we can get into our cars or some of us, our parents' cars, and be able to kind of entertain to take them out. When I got to college, it was just doing research on all the technology and everything that was kind of going on. So at the time, this was as we started getting into a lot of motion stuff and video was starting to happen, <clears throat> excuse me, and I wanted to know how these things work and how we can get into it for the future. So I was always researching in the library, trying to figure out how I can make new things or come up with something and, and get it to interact with my day to day life. I mean, now that stuff is more common, but 16 years ago, not so much. Actually, 20 years ago, actually now, not so much. So it was always trying to just play with those circuits and figuring out. And, and once again, it was it was tinkering for me. So I always find my ways to find some kind of gadget to mess with. My senior project at the time was motion automated video. So basically I created the whole circuit board uh, from scratch where we had to do it on a breadboard starting there first, got it all working. Basically it was when a when motion was detected in an area, whatever area you had to set up, basically it was start video and the video would record. Again, now that's very common. 20 years ago, not so much. But again, I had to sit there, design the circuit, put every piece in. I had the carpet board where I had to actually make sure the board and the circuitry was connected to it and everything worked. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> in that project, I didn't get it to work, but on the breadboard, it was it was all perfect. It was fine. I was glad I recorded it because my teacher still gave me credit for it, but I couldn't get it to work when I transferred to it, the, the, the PCB board at the time. Uh, another project I kind of did when I was in college was I took I, I built a RC car um, just to get it up and going. Uh, I then attached a camera to it in hopes of trying to drive that camera around the area and being able to see video. Video at the time was really light and I couldn't get that great of a signal. So it didn't needless to say, I probably got about 10 feet away from me and video just went away. But I was glad that I was able to do that. So now in STEM being more of a professional, it's still kind of the same things. So lots of research. Whenever there's something coming out, I always want to know what the latest and greatest technology is going on. I want to see what new what new devices they have out there. What can I use in my field and how can I use it? Uh, I do a lot of training. 
So I go to these different companies that put out all these things and I sit there and let them teach me about their products. Just plain and simple and see how it is. I still do a lot of tinkering, still car audio. I have my own car that I play with now and I do put the big speakers in and take in and out from here and there. Uh, the other piece of it is I network with people. I continue to talk with others and say, what it is you do in your field? How, how do you have fun in your field? You know, my field is theme park industry, but I talk to people that's in the aerospace and say, okay, what do you do? How, how does, how do you intertwine what you learned in school to what you know today? And, and I continue to build off those relationships. And then there's also just on those same lines of networking, there's different conferences that we get to go to. So for me right now, there's one, um, ASTM, which is specifically for theme parks. And all we do is talk about theme park troubles, problems, uh, ways to make things better, ways to make things safer. And we just focus on that. And that's the way that I kind of continue to do that. So just kind of going into my career and what I do, start out with this little small video here. Chris, can you turn it up? It's kind of low. Maxed out. Okay. All right. So like I said earlier, I work for Universal Parks and Resorts. So basically to me, I get to come to work and have fun all day. <laughs> uh, no. So just over my career, I, I, before I get into kind of what I do now. So my career, I started out here in 2006 as an energy management tech. Basically, I went around and tried to help the company reduce conserve energy 5% year over year. Um, we just find different ways to kind of reduce the energy footprint and see how we can lower our power bill every year. Um, the next year I kind of, I got promoted to electronic specialist where I was working, work, I was working on all of our building automation control systems. So I did a lot of fire alarms, HVAC controls, lighting controls, uh, anything that was kind of electronic related and we control the buildings, uh, access points. That's that's what I worked on. Just tried to make sure to keep those systems up and running. Uh, in 2012, I decided to take on something new, challenge myself. So I became a show control animation tech over at our Forbidden Journey attraction over in Islands of Adventure. 
where at this point I began to learn about industrial controls and and, and control systems for for our, our different attractions. So this is where I started to learn about PLCs and uh, how we build those systems and how they just control our rides and, and just everything that goes into them, building, understanding the safety and all the aspect that goes into them. Uh, from there, I got the opportunity after networking a little bit with, I met with the director of engineering at the time. So she was able to offer me a position as associate engineer controls. That was in 2013. With this position, I started understanding just how we dealt with all of our ride reliability, making sure the rides, again, were always safety. Safety is always number one. So I was doing a lot of that. And, and, and I got the, this one, I got the chance to work on a lot of our attractions. So all of our attractions are, you know, we, we have to keep them up and running because when people come to the park, what do you want to do? You want to ride their ride. So I was, it was me and my team that was always constantly trying to make sure they were available. Uh, Three years later, got promoted to engineer one. So basically just took on more, more responsibility, bigger attractions. Uh, like let's say, so my first year as an associate engineer, it was more so like rides we call flat rides around and around. So Kang and Kodos or uh, one fish, two fish, if you're familiar with any rides here to when I got to controls one, kind of got upgraded a little bit at the time. It was, I got to take care of my first roller coaster, which was Dueling Dragons, which is actually two roller coasters in one. So started making small changes to that, making modifications as needed, where it was to actual hardware or if, if it was to the various components and, and just trying to keep the ride again as re reliable as possible and as safe as possible. And I had to try my best to get as many people through that ride as possible. Um, two years later, went to Engineer 2, where I got even more fancier attraction. So this is when we get into what we call our e-tickets. So Transformers, Spider-Man became some of my rides. I also had the opportunity to work on, at the time, Gringotts, which is a, another another attraction out of our Harry Potter series, along with help assist opening um, Kong Skull, or Reign of Kong Skull Island. I want to make sure I say that correctly. Um, which was just one of our, our trackless vehicles and just, again, assisting with that, make sure it's reliable, uh, make sure we had a lot of safety. I played a good pivotal part in trying to make sure that I was able to help make some design changes because there was a lot of things, there was a lot of flaws when we first got that system, but we continued to increase it because again, our, our team that I was a part of, our goal is always reliability. Uh, until today, where I'm seeing engineer for the engineering safety department and now I basically refurbish all of our attractions that we have across our five, our five parks that we want to maintain that IP, that intellectual property. So for instance, if we have, well, we do have Revenge of the Mummy in Orlando. We have Revenge of the Mummy in Singapore, Universal Singapore. And then we also have Revenge of the Mummy in Hollywood. So my team is the team that will come together, say, okay, Let's do a feasibility study. Let's see what all needs to be changed, what all needs to be updated. And then we come in and, and update those systems. Very simply put, the way I always like to tell everybody is the way I approach it is I come in, I take your new iPhone 6, and I upgrade you to the iPhone 12. Unfortunately, I'm not going to take you all the way up to the iPhone 14, but I want you to get into some newer technology and be able to have the stuff to kind of get things done today. Um, right now, working on a project and it is the mummy. We're actually just finishing that project. Uh, we just took it down for approximately nine months where we completely redid all the new control systems. So that's all new PLCs, all new drives, uh, all new uh, relays, wiring, uh, some motors, not all motors, but some. And we just completely gutted it and took it down. We had to do a lot of safety testing. So a lot of testing of making sure that all the systems will be will interact with each other and again, be safe. So just doing that and, and, and preparing for some of that testing, we did over 12,000 tests just to make sure that it was safe to put people on. Uh, we got Once we got through the 12,000 tests, I know I made sure I was one of the first people to ride just to prove that, hey, I believe in this design and everything was safe. And we then allow others to get on. So very cool. I enjoyed it. So from here, uh, I would like to show a video of just how one of our roller coasters were created and made. And that's one of our latest 
May our, our actual our last and latest and greatest roller coaster and as Velocicoaster. coaster. So we're gonna get into this video here, take some time out, get all your questions together. And once it go off, we'll come back and we can uh, we can approach it and, and I'll answer any question that you may have. I remember where it is. Universal Orlando Resort, one of the most popular vacation destinations in the world. Here you'll find rides and attractions based on one of the biggest global box office phenomena of all time, the Jurassic World franchise. And it's where a spectacular new ride has been in development for years, Jurassic World Velocicoaster. Much like the dinosaurs in the films, this remarkable creation is a marvel of ingenuity, technology, and imagination. We're about to take the coaster and see just how Universal hatched this Velociraptor-themed attraction. I'm Mario Lopez. Universal Orlando is letting me take you behind the scenes of this spectacular new ride. So are you ready? Let's go brave the hunt. Coming up with breathtaking attractions is nothing new for Universal Orlando Resort. Visitors from the world over are drawn to its three theme parks, dining and entertainment complex, and eight resort hotels. But in the theme park industry, it's always about the next new attraction, the next big thing. So a few years back, Universal Orlando decided it was time to add another thrill ride, putting it here in the Jurassic Park theme section of Universal's Island of Adventure theme park. The task fell to the people who dreamed up some of the most groundbreaking attractions in the business, Universal Creative. Universal Creative is an incredible, talented team of, of geniuses that have put together uh, for many, many years now some amazing blockbuster attractions for our guests. It's writers, directors, architects, engineers, designers of all kinds uh, that, that are charged with developing all of the product. That means all the theme parks, all the attractions within the theme parks, the shopping, the dining experiences, the city walks, as well as the hotels for Universal Parks and Resorts worldwide. Universal Creative has already developed Jurassic Park and Jurassic World themed attractions in Universal Parks around the globe. Now they have the opportunity to take the franchise to another level here at Universal Orlando Resort. It all starts with the blue sky process where anything goes. It is every day. It is morning meetings, evening meetings, dinner meetings to really develop this idea as quickly as possible because the window of blue sky does close really quickly and you don't want to leave anything on the table. No idea is too outlandish, too crazy. Ideas go down on paper, up on the walls, on computer screens throughout Universal Creator. Ultimately, the decision is made to create a Jurassic World themed roller coaster. But when Universal designs an attraction, it's never just a roller coaster. To make it a truly special, unique experience, the creative team is given a mandate for this attraction. Take the thrills and excitement of Jurassic World and translate that to a world class roller coaster. The foundation of our franchise is thrills and the foundation of a theme park is thrills so we have provided universal with dinosaurs that run extremely fast and are very scary and they've created a ride that is extremely fast and very scary we know that jurassic world franchise is action-packed full of excitement and thrills and we wanted the roller coaster experience to be the same we wanted it to be state-of-the-art we wanted it to be exciting we wanted it to be the best there could be. So the goal was to create the same excitement with the Jurassic World Velocicoaster that we created with the movie. The team gets to work. Weeks of research and design, drawings, doodles, sketches, animations. I like brainstorming sessions because like you said, there's all different kinds of media we all like to work in. There are reference photos they can tack up on the board. There's word association, like what does this do? 
um, all of the different uh, colorful sticky notes everywhere. It's like first word that comes to mind, write it down, write it down. Yeah, brainstorming for me, it's it's personally when I start thinking of an attraction, I try to get right to what the emotion of the attraction is. It inspiring? Is it thrilling? Is it is it uh, funny? Whatever that emotion is, what I use to get my my juices flowing is music. So I think musically what does this ride sound like first which sounds kind of weird and but that gets me into more of the raw emotion that we're trying to get with the attraction what i love about the design process is that there's all these limitations that we kind of have to work around and i think that's an interesting part of it all wait a minute you love that yes <laughs> it's a puzzle it's a challenge it's a challenge until the final concept emerges an immersive roller coaster experience centered around the fiercest and most popular dinosaurs in the franchise, the Velociraptors. For the first time ever, guests will be able to enter the Velociraptor paddock and feel the rush of the hunt alongside these apex predators. The attraction will immerse guests in the Jurassic World experience every step of the way, from the moment they enter the queue and throughout the ride itself. It's storytelling on a level one doesn't normally experience on a high-speed roller coaster. From the outside queue to the end of your experience, you'll see 22 raptors in different versions. There's raptors that are hand sculpted. There's raptors that are animated. There's, there's animatronics and just seeing all these different forms and seeing uh, these new creations and effects through the raptors, you, you definitely are going to have a lot of teeth in your face. But coming up with a story for the ride is just the first step of the process. Putting together a roller coaster is much like a strand of DNA. Millions of parts and details have to be put together in just the right sequence for everything to work. Teams must be assembled, schedules put together, outside vendors selected, and of course, the layout of the track has to be designed with daunting challenges to be faced, including weaving a roller coaster through an existing theme park surrounded by neighboring attractions that can't be moved and a body of water bordering the site on one side, the team sets about creating one of the world's most intense roller coaster experiences. The first launch on VelociCoaster starts from a standstill. Uh, we launch from zero to 55 miles an hour in just a few seconds, and we enter the Raptor paddock. So that first launch is going to blow people away. You'll go twisting and turning through the intricate rockwork of the paddock, referred to as the spaghetti bowl by the creative team, passing within inches of several velociraptors who are on the hunt. Then you'll begin the next phase of this incredible ride. A second launch accelerates you to 70 miles per hour, screaming up to the top of a 155 foot arch or top hat as it's called in roller coaster terminology. It is high speed, it is, it is high thrill, it is a roller coaster enthusiast dream. I can't wait to experience the negative G, the airtime on this coaster. Riders will experience four inversions, including the zero gravity inverted stall for some real weightless airtime. And for a finale, a 360 degree barrel roll over the water. So it'll be pretty terrifying cruising around 50, 55 miles an hour right along the water surface and rotating upside down. I think it's going to be an epic moment, both visually offboard and experientially onboard. What's truly unique about this coaster is that the maneuvers actually get bigger and more intense as the ride goes on. But that's not the only thing unique about this attraction. Universal Creative's designers wanted to give riders the feel that they're along for the hunt, joining the Raptors as they race through the paddock. We're like, all right, this is this is amazing. Um, we're so excited, but is that enough? Like, can we can we do anything to make it more? And we just thought it was crazy if we made the actual Raptors chase the coaster. And once we said that. Uh, we couldn't get that album out. So they came up with the idea of using high-definition OLED video screens alongside the coaster. There was uh, uh, companies that had built some prototypes, but they hadn't actually started building a full production set. So we got in touch with, with, the, with the company, and we've got the first set that we're going to be able to put into this attraction. So this is brand new stuff that people get to see. It really places you again right into the movie and you feel like you're living the experience with the Raptors right in front of you. Months of design work has gotten the project to this point, but taking the design of a roller coaster from paper to reality is easier said than done. 
after concept design, we put in preliminary design. That's when we start detailing out steel. That's when we start doing our engineering and our calculations to make sure everything will hold up together and hold up properly. And then after that, we're doing on to detailed design. A little more than two years out from grand opening and site demolition and land clearing begins. Tons of dirt must be moved. Infrastructure work gets underway. There's about 12,000 linear feet of utilities from all kinds of things, water, um, gas, sewer, a storm, everything. It takes an amazing amount of coordination with so many different vendors and contractors. On the actual construction site, we average about three to 400 people a day between the day shift and the night shift. And each one of those contractors has, you know, uh, different types of project managers and superintendents. So right now you're seeing very, very active construction. We're having piles driven right now into the lagoon and the very beginning of the support for our coaster. So just behind me, you'll see our piers. So our coaster supports are going to go right on top of those piers. Uh, really what you're seeing right now is a lot of site preparation. So there's a lot of work we have to do uh, to get this ready for the coaster track to be installed. While the initial site work is underway at Universal, factories in Europe begin fabricating over 5,000 feet of coaster track in the towering steel supports. And let's not forget one of the most important elements of a roller coaster, the ride vehicle. These were designed by Universal Creative, but they too were constructed and assembled in Europe before shipping to Orlando. They say the three most important factors in real estate are location, location, location. But for Jurassic World Velocicoaster, location has turned out to be one of the biggest challenges. It's not just a matter of threading and weaving almost a mile of roller coaster track above, around, and between existing attraction and public areas. Trying to build a massive roller coaster right in the middle of a working theme park is no easy task, especially with no direct access to back of house areas. We knew that site logistics were going to be a difficult task just because of how tight everything is around one another. But I don't think anybody really realized the, the level of difficulty that it was going to be. While much of the work was done behind construction walls and under the lights, the true nature of the project remained a mystery to the general public. Rumors were swirling. In fact, it was a running joke online that Universal Orlando was building the world's largest turtle stand. But once the project began to go vertical, as they say, there was no keeping a secret what Universal Orlando was up to. When Universal creates a movie-based attraction, they're all about authenticity. So naturally, if you're making a ride based on Jurassic World, you got to have some familiar faces. 2,000 miles away in Hollywood, Chris Pratt and Bryce Dallas Howard reprise their roles from the Jurassic World films to appear in the attraction's queue and pre-show videos. One of the great things about having our actors involved in this project is that it brings authenticity to it. We have uh, the original cast coming into this original story. It wouldn't be a universal attraction unless you have these huge characters in the ride. But those aren't the only stars you'll encounter. It just wouldn't be true to Jurassic World without Blue, one of the most recognizable dinosaurs of the entire Jurassic World franchise. And in this attraction, Blue has a starring role alongside the rest of her pack, Charlie, Delta, and Echo. Coaster riders will pass by them at high speed as they race through the paddock area. In the queue, guests will encounter these amazingly lifelike raptors as they make their way towards the ride vehicles. We have in one of our queues, we have uh, raptor head uh, animated figures. So they're just going nuts. Literally, the entire raptor is alive and, and moving. We have, you know, eye movements, they snarl, they, they breathe on you. They're capable of a lot of low and a lot of screaming. I think it's going to be a really special moment, and I think our guests are really going to love the opportunity to have that up close and personal experience with our raptors. In fact, these velociraptors are so lifelike that Universal Creative actually had to come up with a smell for them. We had to ask ourselves this question, what does a raptor smell like? We, we sat down, we worked with a, uh, a scent company. We looked at, you know, hot breath and um, blood because, you know, that's their diet. They finally settled on what you'll smell throughout the queue. So what does a velociraptor smell like? Well, that you'll have to come and find out for yourself. For the universal creative designers, thrills alone aren't what makes a great attraction. Environment is crucial to make you realize you're not just riding a roller coaster, you're stepping into a chapter of the Jurassic World story. The leader of the team responsible for the environment of the Velociraptor paddock actually has a background in designing zoo habitats. In my, my past in working in zoological design, 
one of the many things that I picked up is you need to design for for the animal, right? So in this case, we're providing as much natural habitat as we can as possible in order to allow the animal to mimic its natural behaviors. That includes the ideal vegetation to create a lush jungle atmosphere right in the middle of an Orlando theme park. The intricate rock work that riders will twist and turn through in the paddock was constructed to create its own unique thrills. These jagged rock formations and tunnels were each designed, sculpted by hand, and then painted to look completely natural and utterly menacing. Now the environment is just as threatening and just as menacing as the raptors. For every corner, every twist that we would go through, the rock work that in particular had to threaten the guests as much as the raptors. But environment means more than just rocks and plants. Here, the building, signage, and other details all look like they came right out of the Jurassic World films, immersing you in the story. The interior of the building had to be designed to withstand the forces of a roller coaster roaring through its walls dozens of times an hour, 365 days a year. There's all kinds of challenges. There's, again, there's so much coordination. The amount of things going on, spaces overlapping each other in and out. And there's different levels of actual space, uh, different people, different systems that have to interact with each other all the time. That's really what makes it challenging, but it makes it exciting at the same time. While the building exterior, as well as the foliage, landscaping, and the track itself had to be ready for the extremes in heat, humidity, and rain that comes with this Florida locale. But one of the biggest challenges in the creation of Jurassic World Velocicoaster had nothing to do with weather, location, budget, or time. Early in 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic hit, and like everywhere else, the project was significantly impacted. It was quite a challenge. But, you know, that was, we were in the middle of putting in our, our concrete foundations for the project when that happened and uh, trying to figure out how to you know keep construction going while protecting all the workers. We facilitated things like virtual reviews uh, to ensure that we were still able to get our 360 degree look of every little uh, aspect of the vehicle as it was finishing its design uh, and able to be bought off creatively um, before it was shipped over here. But through it all, there was one silver lining. During the weeks the theme parks were closed to the public, the construction team was able to work around the clock without having to worry about blocking walkways or inconveniencing guests. The project remained on schedule and, as construction continued, hit milestone after milestone. The top hat is raised. The final piece of track is installed. The futuristic-looking ride vehicles arrive from the factory in Europe. The ride show network, which has been running for months off-site, is unplugged and reinstalled in the ride and show building. The Velociraptors arrived from the workshop across town. And one of the biggest milestones of all in the wee hours of the morning, the Velocicoaster team gets to witness the coaster vehicle's first launch. It's been three years, four years in the making. Um, we're all pretty stoked. So it's exciting to see the train actually start to get up to speed and, and uh, launch up that day. It's kind of like seeing your baby come to life in a way. It's one step closer to ultimately seeing the ride running at full speed. A few weeks later, the first riders get to take their initial ride on the coaster. Universal Creative Executives and key members of the design team get the honor. We've been testing this thing for months on end, and now we finally get to ride it. Nothing like the front seat of one of the first rides of a new coaster. Super fast. Around every turn is a, is another explosion. It's just wild. Okay, I was nervous, but now I just want to ride over and over again. The choreography of the ride is just like a it's like a heavy metal ballet. But there's still much work to be done as opening day approaches. Each aspect of the ride has to be absolutely perfect. That means testing, testing, and more testing. The team applies the finishing touches throughout, making sure the building is show ready both inside and out. Until finally, the day everyone has been waiting for arrives, Jurassic World Velocicoaster opens to the public. Gotta ride the Velocicoaster, you have to do it. It was unbelievable. All right, best roller coaster I've ever been on in my entire life. I feel. I'm, I'm shaking, but I felt like I was in another world. My eyes were watering, the ride was so fast. My favorite part was where it goes upside down. 
feel like you can almost touch the water. It's really cool. And then the drop. That drop. I'm wanting to do it again. Just like immediately get back in line, no matter the length of the wait. It's just like, it's worth it. It's so freaking shoot you up twice and it just don't stop. Uh, 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 I want to go back on. Amazing universe, thank you. In just over three and a half years, the project has gone from initial brainstorming to the first guest screens. It was a question of, you know, how can we deliver the next level of thrills? We already have some of the greatest coasters on Earth. We think uh, the Velocicoaster will take that to a whole new level. What's groundbreaking about this attraction is the fact that there is a level of storytelling and a level of immersion on a 70 mile per hour coaster. Who does that? And that's something that only Universal could do. Everything about about this ride is, is really going to break new grounds, and I know guests are going to be thrilled. I want people to feel exhilarated when they get off of this ride, and that's what we try to do when we make our films, and I know that's what everyone on the team has done uh, to create uh, what I think is one of the best roller coasters in the world. I'm so proud to be part of it. The most rewarding part is just knowing the fact that we created something that's going to generate smiles for years and years to come. And I can't wait to see their face. I think the fact that coasters are so aspirational and is really about facing a fear and accomplishing something you didn't think you could do, I'm really, really looking forward uh, to that moment when another guest will get that experience of realizing what they can do. For the team at Universal Creative, it's time to celebrate. And then, ride back to the drawing board on their next amazing attraction. For you? Well, hey, you got to come to Universal Orlando Resort and get ready to join the Raptor Pack. I'm Mario Lopez, and the hunt is on. All right. How cool is that? That's one of my favorite parts of my job when I get to see just at the very end there when people get off and they are just blown away and they enjoy themselves and they had so much fun and they don't know what to do and they just want to come back and ride again. Um, really always love that part of it. Uh, last thing I was, oh, one thing I want to point out here is that the, the coolest part to me about that, that roller coaster in particular is our lead engineer and main designer was a black gentleman by the name of Deontay Henderson. So I always want to make sure I give him his love and his flowers for, for creating such a great, uh, a wonderful ride. And on top of that, the lead show designer for that was also a black gentleman by the name of Greg Hall. So I always want to show that, hey, this is black excellence at its best. The last slide I kind of got right here is just showcasing some of our black engineers that we have here at site. Just to let you know, hey, they're regular people just like you and I. And we all like to have fun. We do things with our kids and our families. And we're here and we enjoy what we do. So just want to show some of those faces because I always want to put them on display to let them know that you can see it, you can be it. So just know that we are out here and we're working hard and we, we're always trying to find ways to give back and, and help out. So with that being said, I just kind of open it up to questions. Okay. I have a few questions. So I'm going to wait to have people in the chat, but we can have questions. So I saw a whole... Okay, so we had talked about engineers' role in this roller coaster, right? But it seemed like it was a whole bunch of other people working, you know, like when they talked about the habitat. So when we so we talked about the role that engineers do have on designing roller coasters, but it seems like y'all create an experience. <laughs> so who are the other professionals? that roller coasters have to collaborate with on a project like this or, you know, any pro any projects. So starting out like this one in particular, uh, like I said, we got all the engineers. So let's get into the different types of engineers. So you have controls engineers that's going to actually work on the brain of the, the, the attraction and tell it when to go, when to stop, when, to, when you know, when, when something's wrong. Uh, you have civil engineers and mechanical engineers that go through the dynamics and say, you know what, I wanted to be this fast. I wanted to turn like this. I need the track to have this type of bend. 
they're studying the math and they're studying the physics of it and they want to make sure that they're putting so many what we call g's onto the body so they want to make sure that we're not pushing you to the limit but we are getting you as close as possible because we want you to feel it and, and feel that excitement on your body um then you also have civil engineers that make sure that the actual pillars and where they go and the, the footers what they were talking about for the actual structure where it should be uh outside of that we have arborists that come in and like say that that curate the environment for instance uh we have show designers that come in and curate the facades and the look and what's going on we have finance people that have to make sure that we're staying on budget and that we're doing everything like we said we're going to do we're going to do it for 10 million or are we going to do it for 20 million are we on are we on budget or are we off budget so they have finance people that pay attention to that we have project managers that make sure that everybody is coordinating and talking so if i need to come pour some concrete over here but if they're over there trying to do some testing something's not going to happen so we got to have somebody that's kind of over it a project manager who's maintaining it and make sure everybody is working in, in symphony as much as possible um some other people we have are technicians that come actually do just checks on the rise or come make sure that they they help with installation of various things we have uh electricians we have uh what else what am I missing? Electricians, we have painters because they have to come paint the facade and take care of all of that. It's so many different workings that go into it, as well as just we call the arts people that come in and it's it's their design and say how they want it to be. And we're trying to make sure we're still making their vision. Okay. Well, this is a random question. Why was the the roller coasters pieces being built in Europe and how did they get over here? So that's where our main vendor is for all of that steel. So that's where the, the, the manufacturer of the actual roller coaster, they, they were stationed in Europe. So the pieces, the track is built in sections and they build them however, you know, how fast it takes them to do it. And they get shipped over here, actually. So it's all put on one giant boat and sit over here in pieces. And, you know, it takes <laughs> 10 days, two weeks sometimes for that stuff to get here. And once it get here, we slowly start to put it together. I, uh, you know, once it gets shipped over, obviously we put it on the truck. You probably rolled past the truck and didn't even know it was on it or it was covered up really well. It was just a track that was coming. Wow. And so this is an interesting thing that you said. There's somebody that that manages your budget. How important is it for engineers to stay on budget and what happens if you're over budget? Like, I feel like Universal, y'all got all the money, so y'all get more money. But does that happen with all projects? And sometimes there really is no more money and you have to stay in budget. So there's always uh, what they call the estimation starting out in the beginning. Hey, this is what we want to do. Uh, we, we estimate everything down to the nuts and bolts and how many nuts we're going to have, how many bolts we're going to have, how many pieces of track, what it's going to cost, how many uh, relays, how much wire. We, we, we estimate all of that out and then say, hey, this is going to cost $25 million. That's what we want to pay for this project. Uh, we track that as we go along, and our, our job is to stay on pace and on budget as much as possible. I will say that a lot of our projects do go over budget, unfortunately, and it's usually because of just testing and trying to make sure that we get to that point of say, me as the engineer, unfortunately, I'm not completely worried about the budget because my goal is to always make sure it's safe. And then once it's built, that it's going to be reliable. So after that, it's just kind of on the project manager and everybody else to really reel me in when needed and say, hey, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Or are we getting too much over budget? And then we find things to kind of make sure we reduce it. A lot of times, too, what happened is we have a concept and again, we say, hey, we know it's going to cost 25 million. Well, they say, well, you're only getting 22. So we got to find things to take back and say, you know, what? well, we're not going to do this piece. We was going to add this new cool wall over here that was going to show your reflection. But now we're not going to do that anymore. So sometimes you have to find ways to kind of reduce the scope as well. So can you do this job? if you do not like roller coasters because you said you test your roller coasters um the people in the video was riding it so if you don't like roller coasters can you still be a part of building and designing or do you have to be willing to test them you can have this job and not like it at all um there are particular rides that i just won't ride myself um for instance I hate drop towers. That's rides that take you straight up and drop you straight down. 
And I was in a predicament one day where I was troubleshooting because I was in the sustaining department and I was troubleshooting and we kept, we couldn't figure out the issue. The part of the issue was the waste sequence. And they said, hey, we want to just put people on it to weigh it and see what it's doing. And I refused to get on. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't want to do it. And they're like, well, we, we're not going to shoot it off. We just want to weigh. And I'm like, no, I'm sorry. And nobody's going to force you to do it. But who doesn't want to try out their their design or what they just put all their hard on work hard on working to? So again, I just finished the project at the Mummy. I was one of the first people in the first row trying to get on to make sure when we when we found, we finished our last test to say, hey, we want to ride. Yes, I do want to ride. Let me get on. I want to see how it is. So do you rotate? So like you don't do the drop ones. I don't do those either. I feel like there's no room for air. You're just flat on the ground if it don't work. Or you're, you know, do you all rotate? Like, do you say, hey, you know, you get to ride X amount of rides. Do you have like a call for rides when it's time to test them? So when we first start testing, uh, when we get to the end of what we, we, we like I said, we go through a lot of tests before we allow people to get on. So we test all the safety systems, make sure everything's good. Once we get on that point, typically people that are directly associated with the project, like the engineers or the designers, they're the first ones to ride. When we feel like we're in a good spot, we invite the president to the company to come ride because we want him or her, well, now her to feel good about it as well. And then we slowly open it up to other uh, team members within the company to say, hey, come ride this ride. Unfortunately, in that same instance, we're kind of treating them like test dummies. <laughs> like we want you, we want to see if we can break it while you're on it and see what's going on. And then we it helps us, you know, increase that reliability because again, that's what it's about. So by the time that we get it to the public and say, all right, public, you can come ride. We put a lot of cycles on and we put a lot of tests into it and we feel pretty good about it. Okay. So this is the question that I have. Okay. So you talked about tearing up and breaking stuff. Right. And then you talked about some of the things you did in college and early in your career. So I guess it's a two part question. Um, how much of the stuff that you learned, like in college and tinkering with stuff, were you able to take to your job from day one, like that knowledge? And then how much of the stuff you actually kind of, for lack of a better term, on the job training, like specific to the work that you're doing now and as you progress in your career because we saw you had a lot of positions <laughs> so for me uh the stuff that i learned in school to me it's all always kind of the lecture and theory and luckily for me i had a lot of labs that went along with a lot of my classes so i was able to kind of put some of that theory to use right then and understand what it, what it did but when I got into the field, so the first couple of years of my, my career was as a technician. So actually doing a lot of stuff in the field, putting my hands on things, replacing things, troubleshooting, and just to have that light bulb go off like, oh, that's what they were talking about. Like something simple, like a transformer. A transformer, all it does is take one voltage and step it down, step it down or up to another voltage. Uh, everybody right now is probably doing this from some kind of device or they have a laptop at home. That laptop you plug into the wall, that wall is 120 volts. It goes down into typically a little box, whether you got a Mac or a regular, you know, a PC. It goes into a little box. That little box is the transformer. That now takes that voltage from 120 volts coming out of the wall and takes it into 12 volts to power your laptop. So just learn understanding stuff like that. and like, oh, man, this is how it works. And, and understanding, you know, other components that came up you saw them when you were in the field. So right there from day one, I was able to be like, all right, this is cool to know and understand how it works. Now, a lot of it outside of that too is the one thing about getting your degree is you officially have learned how to learn. So you know and you tell people and you tell a, 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 a an employer that, hey, I know how to learn. So most of the time when you go into new jobs, like for instance, I didn't take any classes on control systems. I learned a lot of that on the, on the job. I did it, you know, from people that just passed the knowledge down to me, some of it trial and error. So yes, I've blown up some things at work in my, in my career, unfortunately, and, you know, cost the company some money, but it was all for me to learn. I've never made that mistake again now because I learned the hard way 
But yeah, that's some on the job training that you know people will show you how to do things, especially when you show that you want to learn. As well, that's always kind of books and manuals that come with all the different devices and systems too. So you read those things, and that's how you, you pick it up. That's good. So, it like you're doing roller coasters now. What if you decide I don't don't want to work on roller coasters again? But it doesn't seem like you will, because that seems like a pretty job, fun job. Is there anything close to roller coasters that you can like apply that knowledge and go work on tomorrow? If you decide, like I'm tired of working at Universal Studios. I mean, so obviously within, well, before I say outside of Universal, within Universal, we have other types of rides outside of roller coaster. So we have plane simulator mm -hmm. rides. We have rides that we get into virtual reality now that's coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, we we have what we just call flat rides that are just simple going around spinning. You know, there's plenty to work on. Uh, outside of that, this also can translate into, and, and it goes both ways, into like mm -hmm. the aerospace industry or the defense industry. Like a lot of people actually come from those industries and work in the theme park industry. And again, you go the other way around, or even for me, like working into the uh, car producing industry. So the car manufacturing, uh, a lot of people come from those to work with us too, because they do a lot of things with robots. You know, we have rides that deal with robots here and again, vice versa. So I can go work on those robots. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of the, the uh, things that to keep in mind though for me is if I go to those fields, like for instance, just car manufacturing, everything is done in reverse. So with car manufacturing, they build robots and they do a square around and say, hey, we don't want you to come into this area. If you come into this area close to the robot, stop the robot. We don't want anybody to get hurt. The same part, we do it in reverse. We put you on the end of that robot, hold you in there and say, we don't want you to get out. We're going to make sure that we do everything to protect you and keep you in here. We're going to swing you around, throw you around and everything and say, all right, we don't want you out. If you get out, then we got to stop the robot. So those those things, that's kind of other fields that can go back and forth or interchangeable with that. Okay, so how does one get into building in the theme park industry? Like, what are the different degrees they can get? Um, how do they find out? Do they like job the Universal Parks come to FAMU to recruit? Or how do you get in that field? So I am pushing myself to get Universal to come to FAMU more to recruit. So that's one start thing. That's one big piece there. Uh, to get into the theme parks, typically, if you have any type of engineering degree and you apply for a theme park role, technical role, you should be able to get into it. If you want to, even if you're into just mathematics, we do a lot of statistics to make sure we look into the probability of things. So that's another way that you can get into it. There are people that do arts. So if you want to design things and design sets, so if you have an art degree or some kind of design degree, that's another way that you can get involved as well. So there's multiple avenues to become, to get into the theme park industry. There's also clubs called, like for instance, uh, theme entertainment, uh, theme entertainment, amusement. And I think that's Tia, it's Tia out there. There is a group, uh, there are certain, there are certain schools out there that have clubs. So I know Ohio State is one of the biggest ones that, that exist out there. I believe UCF has one here locally in Orlando, but there are different groups that, that, that exist that kind of really push the theme park industry as well. So, so my last question, what advice would you give a team that is, you know, saw this video or loves roller coaster and is like, I want to do that? Like, what, what advice would you give them? The biggest advice I would say is uh, is kind of set a plan, let those around you know about it, and, and work hard to get there. Um, there's more, like I said, there's multiple avenues to get there. That's you don't necessarily have to have a degree, but also the degree is going to help you. But there are ways to get there. There are people that want to help you get there. And like I was telling people, the more people around you that you tell and say, hey, you know what, I want to be an engineer or I want to work at theme parks or I want to build a roller coaster, you'll be surprised at how many people actually want to help you get to that goal. So be open, work hard, let people know your goals, set goals, first of all, and, and work towards them. Mm -hmm. I think that's it. Thank you so much. I'm so excited. You know, I tell people all the time and I'm totally biased that HPEC graduates, especially FAMU graduates, 
leave our campus and do some amazing things. And so now you're, you know, left fam and now you're building roller coasters and had this great, um, amazing career um, doing amazing things and applying your engineering knowledge for fun, right? Um, and changing that myth that, you know, if people didn't see you on the street, they wouldn't know you design roller coasters, right? <laughs> Just like right. that's Chris, right? But now you're like, I'm Chris, I'm an engineer, I design roller coasters. <laughs> right. I always got to make sure they know. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. This is just such a great thing. And I hope that the kids that live stream as well as kids that catch it on our YouTube channel really learned a lot. Um, that was a great video. At first, I was like, he's showing a video. But I don't think that there was any other way you could explain the process and how how many people work on a roller coaster and the fact that it takes like three years from concept to actually being able to ride the public. So you have to be patient too, right? Right. All right. Well, thank you so much, Chris. Um, hoping that everyone enjoyed it. And if you want to learn how to do roller coasters, this is a great idea to get into the industry. And just remember, make your plan. Tell people about your plan and know that people are willing to help you. So this is our last Teen Science Cafe of 2020. So we want 2022. Why am I 2020? 2022. <laughs> We're going forward, not backwards. Um, right, right. And so I appreciate, Chris, you closing us out um, 2022 because the holidays will be around the corner. And so... Um, you can look for our next thing, which are our code workshops. So we're going to spend the next few weeks judging STEM fairs and hosting our code workshops before we take our holiday break. But good evening, and we'll see you at the next SEM Link event.